But to get everybody oriented uh, about what, how this session is going to work and what we're going to, um, how we're going to go, um, I've, we've invited four discussants, actually five discussants, who will participate primarily in our conversations. And I'd like to break it up into approximately 15 minute segments for each of our discussants to sort of take the lead in speaking to one of four uh, questions or topics that I sent out to our discussants before our meeting today. And so that you can get a sense of what, uh, what we're going to focus on here, I'd like to read out those four questions. Um, the first one is to do with um, reflections on folklore research prior to 1990 uh, and thinking about the intervention of the state in determining what research was prioritized and what topics were off limits. Uh, how is it that researchers such as yourselves and also your colleagues find ways to pursue their own specific interests, uh, particularly when they didn't align with the interests of the state? Um, second topic is reflections on the fact that it was socially and politically uh, discouraged to discuss Jewish interaction with local Moldavian and Ukrainian folk music inside of the academy, even as Jewish music was collected in, in, in several areas, and in, in, um, particularly in Romania, uh, Jewish music was collected from Jewish informants and non-Jewish informants. But it is my understanding, and I'm waiting to be corrected, that in a lot of places you couldn't speak of a Jewish influence on Romanian or Moldavian f traditional music as being like a component of that music or showing an influence. And then topic number three is reflections on um, field work that was conducted in locations without a functioning Jewish community or a local musical life. Um, in, in our discussion so far, uh, all three of our informants, all three of our discussants, Vasile, Domnul Vasile, and Speranza, and Christian David, um, were working in areas where the Jewish population was mostly absent and had been absent for some time. Um, and almost, almost, not all, but almost all informants were non-Jewish or unacknowledgedly Jewish. Um, and so we're, 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 we're working with uh, music that had been uh, a musical culture that had been radically disrupted by the time that any of us, uh, any of you, came uh, into the field to do your work. And then, and to those three questions, I would like to add an important observation from Zev, who wrote um, that it was striking that Ukrainians did not seem to work the Jewish dance tunes into a Ukrainian musical culture in a manner comparable to what Buko Bukovini and Moldavian musicians had in relation to Moldavian dance culture. In other words, remnants of Jewish Indonesia were more prevalent even in the earlier recordings from Podolia than in Vasile's recording from Bukovina. Uh, and that this process of adaptation seems to have been older in Bukovina than in Podolia. So those are our four framing topics. Um, I'd like to in welcome again everybody who has joined the recording and joined our session since we first opened it up. And um, the first person that I would like to call on is uh, Vasile Kiselitsa. Uh, actually, before I do that, I would like to just introduce everybody on our panel to those of you who have not attended our first sessions. Um, to my right is uh, Speranza Radulescu, who is an uh, ethnomusicologist, uh, musicologist and folklorist extraordinaire from Bucharest. Uh, she published a really important thesis work in 1984 on um, harmonization in Romanian traditional uh, bands and has gone on to do incredible field work with Roma musicians, uh, Musica Lautariasca, and uh, folklore popular um, folklore and village music from all around Romania with her colleague Florin Jordan, who also joins us today from Bucharest, who has been a co-conspirator and a partner of Speranza in the field, putting together the Ethnophonie record label, which has been an, an incredible source of documentation of traditional music in Romania in a really crucial period between 1990 
and the mid 20 teens, so to say, in capturing some of the oldest, uh, a generation of musicians who grew up in the communist period and so, and therefore had uh, a really direct continuity of their own local traditional folk music uh, in a way that has started to really dissipate now as we enter the 21st century. Vasily Kiselitsa uh, joins us from Kishina, Moldova. He has done uh, extensive field work uh, from the 80s into the early 2000s in uh, Moldova, Republic of Moldova, in uh, Ukraine, uh, particularly in the, what we call the northern Bukovina region um, around Chernauts and along the border in northern Romania. His work uh, primarily has been with uh, Moldavian folk music and local Ukrainian traditional musics uh, through the, most of his career, but he also spent uh, has taken an interest in understanding um, genre distinctions in uh, that have to do with Jewish music as it interacts with those local folklore musics. Uh, and that's been a t that, that was some, some of the things we talked about uh, last weekend. Christian, I think, has not joined us yet. Is that right, Clara? Okay, so uh, we have Walter Zav Feldman here is here also as a discussion. Uh, artistic director of the Klesmer Institute and uh, sort of a guiding light in our um, understanding of the role of Ashkenazic Jewish music and Ashkenazic expressive culture uh, in Europe as a whole and particularly in understanding the this uh, interaction between various cultures, particularly in Bessarabia, Moldova, uh, between local uh, Roma Lautar professional musicians uh, and Jewish musicians together and in understanding the influence of the Ottoman Turkish music and Greek Fenariat music um, on all of this larger musical complex within um, Moldova, Bessarabia, uh, eastern part of Romania. Um, Zev has asked me and I am happy to oblige uh, for, ch for Clara to drop into the chat the links and information about a uh, couple of really important articles on these topics. Um, uh, this was, uh, the one was uh, just recently published in, um, here we go. Uh, the title, we published this on our website, but the full citation and the full credit goes to the Revista di Ethnografie e Folklore, uh, which is run by Marie Marian Balasa in Bucharest. Uh, the title of the piece is Klezmer Tunes for the Christian Bride, the Interface of Jewish and Romanian Expressive Cultures in the Wedding Table Repertoire from Northern Bessarabia. So I'm sure that Zev will talk a little bit about that later, but I wanted to make sure that we have that information right here at the beginning. And then the second article that I think is very instructive uh, in understanding the interaction between Jewish and Romanian Moldavian uh, music is a new article about the Sinescu family. Um, which originated in Yash, and it shows their musical path from uh, Moldova to America. That's also published on the Klezmer Institute website, and you can find it there. So, introductions. Now, so I, um, I just wanted to read a couple of experts that Vasile wrote to us, uh, wrote to me um, about a, the first two of these topics, and then I'll ask Vasile to respond in greater depth with our wonderful translator who is here with us today, Ileana Marin, who I failed to mention utterly. <laughs> uh, Ileana Marin, just very briefly, is, a, is, a, is a, a professor at University of Washington in Seattle and also is a, the, the president of the board. President of the board of the Romanian uh, Cultural Association in Seattle. So more, more to come on that topic. But Vasily writes, uh, that he that he tacitly established his personal priorities in research without officially declaring them in writing to the administration of his department. He preferred to make individual uh, expeditions of two people for somewhere between uh, 10 to 60 days a year um, every summer, between 1985 and 1989. And this was one of his strategies for being able to conduct his own, uh, follow his own research interests 
um, and he was able to operate freely without anyone's control, the subjects he addressed to his informants. But he writes, he did not touch any of the taboo topics related to Soviet politics and culture, nationality, or inter-ethnic relations. Um, he, we did not ask about Jews in particular because it was not a topic agreed, it was not an agreed topic or subject of Soviet uh, ethnological research. So that's one idea. And then the second one he tells, uh, gives a really vivid uh, anecdote that really talks about how, what the practical effects of these things were. Um, he writes on question number two, the theme of the role of Jews in culture, however, sometimes ar arose spontaneously from uh, informants themselves, uh, uh, from, and how they describe musicians, community, and local cultural life in the past. Um, the positive information about cultural education and social life from the interwar period was not agreed. In the folklore collections that are published in speci specialized institutions, such as the Academy of Sciences, the Conservatory, Institute of Art, the Union of Composers, and the Union of Musicians, among others, it, it was avoided to include uh, complete information about the sources. Um, and even the names, the people, the context, and general, inf uh, so, so, so we have names, uh, a little bit of general information given without cultural specification of any kind of uh, ethnic or anthropological uh, content. And so he writes that almost nothing has been published about Husid, Husin, Hus, and Husik uh, as genres of tune names that he discovered in his own work. And he writes that the Hussar dance, uh, which was a local version of the term Husid, Huset, was tr treated as a supposed reminiscence of the Hussar dance influenced by Czech Hus Hussites, right? Uh, in Zas Zastruk, in the Bessarabian opinion of 1862, information was introduced, and he writes that he think it was erroneous, uh, as, if, as if the locals, who, he, who, who are not specified from which area, called the tune the Hussariaska de Joc, and this was probably in order to justify some kind of Hussar origin of the dance. Uh, and in this instance, referring to the Hussars as the elite core of Russian Imperial Army uh, military people. So, and thus this patriotic and expansive um, fact uh, determined and encouraged many Soviet commentators and researchers, including from the Moldavian SSR, to say the same thing in their works. Uh, in this way, they uh, just ex docilely accepted this official state policy uh, on, a, on a thesis of the major, superior, and decisive influence of the Russians on the colonized cultures, right? So any other uh, influence or reciprocity was either ignored or underestimated. So, um, so I think that just really spells out in a great deal of detail um, how these um, very specific colonial ideas were planted and reinforced within the narratives about traditional cultures, folk culture in Moldova. So uh, I'd like to now stop talking for just a moment and turn it over to Dono Vasile, who might like to add something to this, um, this topic, if you'd like to expand a little bit. Dono Vasile, dacă vreți să uh, adresați cele două um, elemente pe care le-ați împărtășit Cristinei um, despre um, mesajul pe care i l-ați trimis. Da, eu vă mulțumesc foarte mult că ați dat citire acestui mesaj. Am, am formulat spontan, nu m-am gândit să formulez așa într-o într într modalitate științifică, dar este bazată pe experiența mea și am vrut să o pun în, în pagină așa, în mod cum am spus spontan. 
uh, Vasila says that uh, the thoughts that he shared with Christina were spontaneous, but all of them uh, rely on his personal and direct uh, experience. Colecția mea pe teren mi-a deschis ochii asupra unor alte melodii decât cele românești moldovenești. Uh, collecting uh, in the field opened his eyes toward other ethnic influences and other tunes that he encountered. Atunci eu noi le dădeam importanță, le, le consideram ca și alte denumiri. Uh, at the time, he didn't realize the importance of these other tunes or uh, the, because he uh, received them or he thought about them as influences uh, in the area. Prima mea revelație a fost anul 1984, când uh, informatorul din Davideni, Go on. Din Davideni așa, uh, Vasile Lupan, violonistul, mi-a spus că știe o coră a lui Zinger. Uh, his revelation, his very first moment of revelation took place in 1984 when uh, in Daviden, Vasile Lupan uh, shared with him, the violinist, shared with him uh, the information about uh, uh, um, Domnul Vasile, încă o dată numele. Hora. Hora lui Zinger. Uh, shared with him Hora, uh, Zinger's Hora. Zinger's Hora. Și el a spus că a învățat această melodie de la Zinger, din Ciudei. Dar Ciudei este o mică comunitate, un mic ștetul. And uh, he told him that uh, he learned the Hora from Zinger from Ciuden, which was a small ștetul. Și s-a întâmplat asta prin anii 32-36, în perioada aceasta, fiindcă el a spus că a început să învețe la 12 ani. Născut în, do- în, do- în 1919, la 12 ani a început să studieze vioara de la cel mai bun lăutar al locului. Îi spunea Petruță Bacreu. Um, and, um... He learned the uh, Hora, Zinger's Hora, uh, sometime between 1932-36, because he started playing violin and he started learning to play the violin when he was 12, when Vasile Lupan was 12, from a very famous uh, lautar in the region, Petre, Petru, and I... Petruță Bacreu. Petruță Bacreu. Era o familie de dinastie de muzicieni țigani, din părțile locului, chiar din Ciudei, dar din, din, de la marginea Ciudeiului, din Crasnișoara Nouă, îi spunea lui, din localitatea aceea. And, uh, 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 Petri, Petruță Bacrău uh, era rom uh, uh, um, gypsy uh, family from Ciudei, but um, they lived uh, in the outskirts of the community. Era cel mai bun muzician care concura cu Zinger. Zinger era, am înțeles că era și el foarte bun și ei concurau între ei. He was a true rival and competitor of Zinger. Actually, they were um, the best musicians in the area. Și iată, Vasile Lupan a învățat de, de la rivalul profesorului lui, lui Bacreu, a învățat această hore a lui Zinger. A ascultat-o și a furat-o, cum a zis el. <laughs> and um, Vasile uh, Lupan so uh, learned uh, uh, the trade, uh, learned um, uh, to perform uh, Zinger's Hora from Zinger himself. And uh, as he told Vasile, you know, I stole it from him. Um, ah. Actually, in Romanian, there is a proverb saying that you steal the trade from the master. Um, so watching and uh, witnessing how the master is doing. Yep, go on. Da, aceasta, a fost, aceasta a fost primul, prima, primul meu contact uh, cu o sursă de proveniență evreiască certificată auditiv de către uh, informator. So that deci, was the first time uh, that he uh, received the information about a Jewish musician um, from an informant, but that was the very first time. Mm-hmm. Poate că acest, această horă nu era pur... Evreiască. 
Însă, modul de interpretare, bineînțeles că era un mod de interpretare, un mod de simțire și de redare, era o interpretare evrească. Ea a și intrat în repertoriul local ca și Hora lui Zinger. So, um, uh, Hora lui Zinger, Zinger's uh, Hora, obviously um, um, had Jewish influence uh, in the way um, it was um, performed, in the way uh, it was uh, perceived, and otherwise, uh, without the information, of course, these elements were still uh, obvious. Când am extins cercetările înspre sud, în regiunea Herța, Herța, Ținutul Herței, mm -hmm. am dat despre Husin, tot nu știam ce înseamnă lucrul ăsta. Și erau foarte multe Husin, foarte multe melodie Husin. I-am întrebat pe unii dintre, dintre informatori și mi-au spus că este melodii evreiești preluate de la evrei. So when he expanded his research um, south to Herza, um, he um, got over, he came across Husen and his informants told him that these are Jewish melodies. Repertoriul acesta s-a îmbogățit când am trecut peste Prut, dincolo de Prut, în partea stânga a Prutului, de la Cernăuț spre stânga Prutului, la Vale, spre Moldova. And uh, his uh, uh, repertoire um, became larger and larger as he crossed uh, the river Prut uh, from Chernowitz uh, south uh, toward Moldova. In special, de la Nozulica, in spre sud, spre Republica Moldova. Nozulica is the stetul stetul cel mai important din fostul județ Hotin, nordul Basarabiei. And uh, that's the area um, uh, around Hotin, um, the northern uh, part of Basarabia. No, Sulica era la granița dintre Imperiul Rusesc. El apare, no, Sulica aparținea de Imperiul Rusesc, iar mai la nord era deja Imperiul Austriac. And that was the place um, at the border between the two empires, the Russian Empire and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Iată. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, we, we're waiting for, I, I could listen uh, uh, to this uh, uh, all day long. Um, and so, so you, so I, if, what I'm taking from this is that you discovered these Jewish connections on your own by being out in the field. And um, I wrote to you this morning and I wonder if you could um, sort of uh, speak to us for just very briefly about uh, some of the people that I mentioned there, which are your, some of your teachers and some of the people that you worked with in Chisinau, um, uh, Stoyanov and Dinul in particular, uh, and helping us to understand um, a little bit more about the music that they put into the collections. I mean, for us in, in North America, you know, this Stoyanov collection is this, um, uh, it's a wealth of information, but it is a mystery because we don't know who is Petru Stoyanov. We don't know how he selected the tunes. Uh, we don't know um, anything really about him, uh, but you know him personally or you know him, knew him personally. And so I'm interested to hear your reflections ab about how tunes were selected, how they made it into these collections and Uh, those kinds of topics. Domnul Vasile, uh, ați înțeles sau vreți să vă repet? Uh, Ideile de bază, puneți. Da. Puneți, vă rog. Um, în primul rând, uh, Cristina a accentuat faptul că dumneavoastră ați descoperit conexiunea dintre uh, muzica folclorică a locului și uh, uh, muzica evreiască pe teren. Și după aceea este interesată să vorbiți despre profesorii dumneavoastră de la Chișinău, despre Stoianov și um, cine este el, uh, cum, um, um, pers pentru că dumneavoastră l-ați cunoscut personal, uh, cum ați ales să uh, culegeți aceste uh, melodii? De deci, descrieți uh, profesorii și pe Stoianov în principal, relația cu el uh, și 
nu, ce a însemnat el pentru mine asta. La prima întrebare. Eu, cum, am, cum am, am început să-l spun, repertoriul de proveniență sau de sursă evreiască am început să-l adun mai mult prin anul 85-86, când am trecut partea stângă a Prutului și am, am cules în partea din nord a Basarabiei. Și muzicienii îmi cântau astfel de melodii, Husic, Husin, chiar și Hused, au spus unii, Hused. Dar cea mai mare parte spuneau Husin. Și am cules și în satul lui Dumitru Blajinu, de la Petru, nu mi-aduc aminte acum cum îi spune lui, și fratele lui cânta la acordeon, tot melodii de Husar și de Husic. Ceva extraordinar de interesant. Să nu uitați că trebuie să ajungeți la ideea profesorului Stoianov, da? Da. So, in 1985 and uh, 86, he uh, came over more and more um, over uh, Husin, Hused, and all these um, names that were um, attributed to um, tunes and melodies. And he also met Dumitru Balajinu, the uh, harmonium, uh, harmonica player. Cred că o să trec la întrebarea două, că să nu... Da, da. Da. Monopolizez spațiul. Deci, pe Petru Stoianu l-am cunoscut în calitate de profesor și de conducător de teză. Uh, Petru Stoianu was the chair of his uh, PhD committee. În anul 1984, v-am mai spus despre acest lucru, am devenit competitor Adică, pe lângă secția de doctorantură, am, am intrat la studii la secția de doctorantură a Academiei de Științe a Republicii din Moldova. And in 1984, he also um, was admitted uh, in the um, Science Academy of Moldova. Și atunci mi s-a propus să-mi fie conducător, că era unicul etnomuzicolog, Petru Stoianov. Era doctor în științe atunci. And, um, Then Petru Stoianov uh, became um, officially uh, his coordinator. Despre biografia dumnealui am menționat des- într-un articol special publicat în revista noastră. Dacă vreți, o să, o să vi-l primit. Dar ce, so, pot, spune, ce pot spune acum? Da, uh, spune. About his biography, about uh, Petru Stoianov's biography, you can learn more from an article that he published and he can share with you. Petru Stoianov era de naționalitate bulgară din sudul Basarabiei care nu este în Republica Moldova, este în Ucraina. De la Bolgrad, regiunea Bolgrad. Uh, Petru Stoianov um, is of Bulgarian descent uh, from the south of Basarabia, um, actually Ukraine, from uh, Bolgrad. S-a născut într-o familie de cu mulți copii. Tatăl său a fost primar în timpul, uh, în timpul României, în, timpul, în perioada interbelică. A fost primar de, de, de primărie, șef de primărie. Uh, his father was a uh, mayor um, in, um, in Bolgrad. Uh, during uh, that time, Romania, uh, actually that part, uh, that territory belonged to Romania during the interwar period. And de in mic, family with many, many uh, kids. De mic copil a învățat să cânte la clarinet, că era tradiția la împărțile sudului, la bulgare în special, să, să cânte la clarinet. A And cântat la nunți. Uh, as a kid, uh, he started um, playing um, the clarinet uh, because that was um, the specific instrument of Bulgarians and he started performing at uh, weddings. Despre viața dumnealui nu iubea să vorbească, avea niște pete. Uh, he didn't want to talk much about his own uh, life. He uh, felt that there were stains in his uh, biography. Mai târziu am aflat, din spusele altora, nu ale dumnealui, a spus că, pe la 12 ani, cădând la o nuntă, marșul de nuntă, care era tradițional la ei în sat, 
marșul regelui, re, regelui marșul re, regal, așa era. Marșul regal se cânta la nuntă. Au venit sovieticii în 1948, l-au luat și l-au dus, l-au despățit de familie, l-au dus la Smolensk să-l închidă. A stat acolo în deportare vreo câțiva ani, vreo 5-6 ani, a făcut, a făcut acolo școală, a și intrat acolo la institutul pedagogic, după care s-a întors la Chișinău. So, um, because he learned as a kid um, to play um, uh, the wedding march, and actually at the weddings at the time, what they perform at the wedding march was uh, the traditional regal. In, uh, regal. In honor of the king of Romania. In 48, when the Soviets uh, took over the region, they arrested him, they deported him to Smolensk, And uh, he spent there five, six years. Of course, um, he attended school and uh, he graduated the institute, uh, the pedagogical institute in Smolensk. And after that period, uh, he could return back uh, to his community. Eu l-am cunoscut într-o într într etapă când era destul de timorat, era destul de stresat să vorbească despre trecutul său. And uh, he met Stoyanov when he was uh, very stressed, very tense, and uh, avoided speaking about his past. Când s-a întors la Chișinău, a intrat la conservatorul din Chișinău, la clarinet. A absolvit clasa de clarinet la Verbetsky, cel mai bun profesor de clarinet, Verbetsky. Apropo, și el pare mi se că era evreu. And uh, Stoyanov um, enrolled when uh, he went to Chisinau, he uh, enrolled in the uh, conservatory um, at the clarinet section, and uh, he attended the class of Verdetsky, who uh, most likely was a Jew. După anul, când trebuia să termine conservatorul, a fost invitat ca specialist muzicolog la Casa Republicană de Creație Populară. Casa Republicană de Creație. So, 1969. Uh, 1969. Uh, in 1969, when he was um, to graduate, he was invited to join the musicology um, uh, department of the uh, Casa Republicană. So the... Um, Acolo el a devenit, a pus, a devenit în poziția tuturor înregistrărilor care le se făceau deja din anii 60, se făceau acolo pe bobine de, de magnetofon. El a transcris foarte multe melodii. Aha. Și a făcut, și în baza celor transcrieri, a făcut această carte. În no, 1972 e publicată. 500 de melodii de jocuri moldovenești. There he um, uh, discovered a, a huge collection of recordings and he started transcribing them and uh, published the collection in 1972. That collection contains about 500 uh, uh, tunes and dances um, uh, that were already okay. there. Okay, I, unfortunately, I think we need to hold that thought uh, there. Uh, I'm absolutely interested in hearing more about him as a person and that collection. I think a lot of us here today would love to know more about him uh, as you knew him. Um, Vasile, but I'd like to turn um, our attention to Doamna Speranza to tell us about some of her reflections on these questions that, that are the theme of our um, conversation today. Uh, I appreciate very much all the work of Vasile, but our um, investigations have a different meaning, different goals. Uh, we couldn't look or finish. It was too late when we, we started. But we could see the consequences of this music upon the Romanian music, uh, popular and uh, academic also. Um, for instance, we don't know if 
Oh my. Dude. Speranza, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you possibly use Florin's uh, headphone to speak, maybe? Uh, I'll try. Oh, this is great. For you, not for me. <laughs> ah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, we noticed the transfer of some melody, Jewish melodies into the Romanian repertoire with small, quite small um, changes. We noticed also that the um, Moldavian music has a more pronounced ca character uh, with all that post Panagios uh, than the rest of the I think Speranza, if you if you are gonna if you're using Florin's, um, you can sit back uh, from the mic. No, no, you. It's okay not you, yeah, it's okay for you to use the microphone of Florin, but but stay. You have to stay back a little bit from the microphone on your computer. Yeah. I'll try. Yeah. Um, I lost my. I'm so sorry. You were talking about. Um... For instance, uh, we know, we saw the Jewish music inserted into the Romanian one, and we tried to notice the specific characteristic of the Moldavian music, quite different from those of uh, Valachia, from um, Montenegro, for instance. Um, at first, we thought. That uh, we thought that the Panariot influences were stronger in Moldavia, and they were stronger because they were enforced by the Jewish. I think. Uh, on the other hand, you probably know that the well-known composer George N. F. was. He lived into a region practically full of Jewish, near Dotorohoi, near Potoshan, near all the localities around were full of And Itemescu, one of his main compositions, piano in folk character, he wrote. It, uh, of course, this sonata. Uh, it's uh, of a main interest for all Romanian musicology. But um, uh, this Romanian character meant, people thought, that it was really purely Romanian, but it wasn't, because it was impregnated of all the uh, intonation of this. And We're having a lot of trouble hearing you, Speranza. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's not a problem. No, no. Uh, For me, it's impossible to concentrate. I understand. I understand completely. Um, what I've asked Florine to maybe do is to... Um, it has another uh, um, goal of this um, research. He wants to uh, take over this musical Jewish pieces and play them with his ensemble. It's a different Uh, Florine, hold on, hold up one second, Speranza. Um, let's just do a little bit of technical troubleshooting here. Um, Florine, I wonder if it's possible for you to mute the microphone on Speranza's computer, or the, the mic, just mute the microphone and then have her speak directly into your earpiece. And she doesn't necessarily have to listen in the earpiece, but just speaking into your mic might be better. Okay. And now I can't. Now we're not getting anything. Oh, now you're. Um, 
Okay, so, all right. Florine, maybe you can keep, uh, unmute, I think unmute Speranza, because we're not, um, we're not, uh, it's not coming through. I think it's about switching the microphone from the headset microphone to the, to this. And it's in the settings that I don't think we have time to troubleshoot right now. But Zeb, did you have something to say about these things that um, Speranza was talking about? It's particularly in the Fenariot's influence. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Seth? Sure, okay. sure, sure. Well, um, uh, it's not good manners to refer to one's own research, but last week, or as you know, I gave a which um, gave a little bit of historical background of the appearance of klezmer, um, klezmer phenomenon among Moldavian musicians, certainly in the early 19th century, and I, do, I think certainly before that in the 18th century. I have to publish this so you can read it and then criticize it as you like, but my main thesis um, We can't hear, now we can't hear you, Zev. What is that? And I was doing so well before. Do you hear me now? Now we hear you. Good. Okay, I'll, I'll get closer in this case, not farther. What uh, in the paper I gave last week in um, in Bucharest, what I was trying to claim was that we have enough early material, like from the 18th century, early 19th century, to suggest that the Jewish musicians, the klezmorim, remember who were one culture, one language. In communicating with each other over many hundreds of miles from Lithuania down to Moldova, uh, they were creating a kind of orientalized and partly Western music, first of all, for the Polish aristocracy, who remember had created this, this Sarmatian theory. If you brush up on Polish history, you, you'll learn that the Polish Schlachta began to claim that they were not really Poles. They began to claim that they were descendant from the Sarmatians, the Iranian nomadic tribe who'd conquered much of Central Europe in the Middle Ages, okay? Believe it or not. So this was dogma for the Polish aristocracy for about 300 years, from the 16th until the, the early 19th century. So, and we begin to see a few manuscripts of klezmer musicians, cantors too, Chazonim, were also violinists, from all the way from Berlin to Gdansk and to Dubno in Volin, creating versions of Mehter music, of uh, Ottoman military music, with a Baroque influence and an Ashkenaz influence. Great, Zev. Thank okay? you. Okay, so um, um, these musicians became very prominent and very influential in Yash, especially in the 18th century. And my paper was about the Ruzhitsky manuscript, which shows this transnational Western and Eastern connection into what the urban Lautar were playing in Yash in the late 18th, early 19th century. It's not folk music. That's the point. It's an urban, it's an urban music and it's very different, let's say, than Anton Pan in Bucharest. Great. Thank you, Zev. Okay. Um, <laughs> so. I'd like to turn our discussion back to our topics, our, our sort of uh, theme topics of the of the day and we'll see if we can um i'd like to continue a little bit with speranza uh to speak about um this this the third topic which is um conducting uh your research on a fragmented music of the past this is what you've been speaking about already and we spoke about this a little bit during our conversation with you several weeks ago but um i have been struck by the rigor that you applied the sort of academic rigor that you applied to your work in collecting music in Botoshan and uh, as a strategy for collecting a minority music where the, um, the musicians and the culture has disappeared. And I wonder if you could speak, you and Florin together maybe could speak about uh, your process and how you approached that specific uh, problem as you structured your research there. Uh, yes, it was a challenge to um, enterprise of such a research into a region where we knew that there are very few, if none, Jews, Jews left. 
but um, I wanted to tell you something about how I, I, I understood to uh, use my very little no knowledge about the Jewish music into Enescu's music. It was quite a scandal in, uh, in Romania and uh, musical centers, uh, circles, when I said that um, a part of this famous third sonata for piano and violin had a strong Jewish influence, especially in the second part. And uh, because for people, the musicians said, uh, if the Enescu wrote in Romanian folk character, character, how could you pretend that it was influenced by the Jewish uh, music? Uh, I have no answer for that, but the, the fact that Enescu was uh, born near Dorohoi, uh, near Potoshani, he left, uh, spent a lot of time in Mikhailen, uh, half Jewish, uh, and uh, he was impregnated with this music. But why did he wrote in Romanian character, uh, Romanian folk character? I think that in his mind, the idea of a nation uh, is the music. His music was a national music. Uh, we have to, to think of the ideology in the beginning of the 20th century to understand that. Because it is true, he never wrote about gypsy musicians. But it, it is impossible that his first violin teacher was a Jew from the uh, And uh, <laughs> um, I do not think that, um, I can, but I denounce. Can you hear me up? No. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear. We hear you great, actually. Yeah. You're it's coming through great. Good. But it's very, I'm very nervous because of that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. It sounds that whole thing is was perfect. Thank you. Keep and and carry on. And also the as I've already told you, in case you heard me, uh, the. Music from northern Moldavia is, more, is full of fanariot reminiscence. Um, um, and uh, it cannot be explained only by the presence of the um, fanariot uh, rulers in the, the, the two principalities, because the, the Montenia was in the same situation, but there, there is no such a music. Uh, as I told you, I think that the post-Fanariot elements were reinforced by the Jewish music existing in the region. Am I right, uh, Zev? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, uh, can you hear me? That's a great, that is a wonderful, I, that is a, yes. that's a really, that's a, an, an incredible insight, Speranza, actually. This yes. idea that that the Fenariot influence is reinforced in that region by the presence of Jewish musicians. Uh, anyway, we didn't uh, work with any musician who ever played for the Jewish. I, I mean, there were some very oldish people who once in their lives played for the Jewish, but they did not, not play the uh, really Jewish manner in the in a Jewish manner. But they used to say probably it was not perfect, but the, the the Jewish accepted us, accepted us. And that told us a lot about the, uh, the human in the relation between the Jews and the the other uh, the, the, the Romanians. Uh, all our um, researches in the Botoshan region was full of this conviction. conviction. The, uh, the relation between Jews and the Romanians were very good, very good. Once one 
musician told us they were kind person. They had this idea with Jesus Christ, but the other way, they were very good people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we had other interests, not only the melodies. Uh, Florin uh, took over some of these pieces and he used to play them with, with his uh, band. But I let him explain you. Huh? Yeah. That's great. Yeah, Florine, do you want to add some about this? And maybe hold on one second, because Clara is going to spotlight you so we can see you. There you are. Hi, Florine. You discuss about this uh, rigor of the research. You wanted to explain to you how the research went. Well, you, you, you really, I, to my mind, you applied this very um, specific process to, to elicit from your informants whether they how they identified certain kinds of music and i just was interested in having you describe that we had a large uh, first we made a large corpus uh, of melodies from the area including uh constantinople melodies that we uh france recorded including uh Ivan roman perishan that uh, gypsy musician from uh, oh. Al -Romain. Can you hold your mic up just a little bit closer to your face so it was uh, the, mel go. the melodies of uh, Yuan Roman Perishan from Adrome. And also we had some uh, recordings from Leon Schwartz. So all these were I know, 30 melodies or maybe more. The initial corpus. The initial corpus. And uh, each of our um, informants had to listen to all of them and said something. Some of them are very quick. Uh, uh, rejected. Rejected. No, 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 no. But others uh, were uh, confirmed. From him. And others had the kind of discussions, like uh, the first part was the more Jewish, and uh, this part is not so much. Or uh, I, I hear it some where it was played or not played. So, some melodies had, uh, how to say, uh, partial confirmation. Either a part of the melody, either just in some uh, very little area was confirmed to be uh, to the Jewish part, is to say so. It's a very interesting work, uh, an important work that you to really dig into this uh, self assessment by the musicians who are the specialists in their area. I mean, I can come in and Zev can come in and we can come in as outsiders and we can do the same process and say that is Jewish, that is not. Uh, but this flip side of the equation is very important as well to have your informants who are on the inside of this say, ah, I identify this as one thing, Romanian, Moldavian, and this part as being Jewish. Um, and, and I think that your, your work um, is really one of the best examples that we have of that insider evaluation. Although I think that Christian also could speak to this. Um, uh, he's, and, and the reason that uh, Christian is not here as far as I can tell is that he's having uh, technical difficulties in Germany. So... Uh, oh. We can't ask him about him, but we will in the future. But ca ca carry on, Florine. I don't know if you had some more. And also, Vasile, maybe you have something to add to this discussion. If you permit me, I would like to make a little completion to what I have said about the collection of Zashuk, Alexander Zashuk. He was an officer in the Imperial Army. And in the year 1862, he published the work of de bază, care se numește Descrierea geografică și statistică a Rusiei. Regiunea Basarabiei. Ok. Uh, Vasile uh, wants to, um, uh, to add a comment and uh, refer to a book published in 1862 by an officer, uh, Alexander uh, Zaschuk, uh, this, uh, the title of the book is uh, The Geographic and Statistic Description of, um, of Russia. Of Russia. Russia. Besarabia Oblast. 
Basarabia mm. Obrast, uh, the region Basarabia Obrast. Acolo, pentru prima dată, Dumnezeu include informație despre despre terminul gusărească, gusărească de joc. Uh, there, for the first time, uh, he mentions the term gusărească de uh, joc, uh, meaning uh, uh, of uh, dance, uh, dance, uh, a reference to a dance. Acest termen se pare a introdus o foarte mare uh, incertitudine și ambiguitate. This term itself introduced um, um, a lot of uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. Termenul gusărească nu l-am găsit nicăieri uh, atestat în vreo publicație într-o vreo colecție ulterioară. The term itself um, Vasile hasn't um, Uh, come over in any other publication um, to uh, attest the presence or um El spunea că acest acest joc l-a cules în parte de nord a Basarabiei. He mentioned deci that zona uh, zona unde este este, este Husarul, Husic. Uh, uh, and uh, he mentioned that he collected uh, that dance from the northern part of uh, Basarabia, the Husic uh, region. Right. Denumirea right. gusărească de joc a fost luată mot a mot de către cercetătorii patrioți sovietici și a spus că a existat un joc al husarilor, care se numea husărească. Ceea ce nu este corect. That's great. Yeah, to prove that uh, actually the Soviets wanted to uh, prove out of their own patriotism that Guzarasca actually is derived from Husar. Uh, uh, Great. So, Vasile, excuse me, one moment. Um, I'm going to stop you there because we, I, I read to our group uh, what you wrote on this topic already at the beginning of our session. Okay. A, a citit uh, Cristina la începutul uh, prezentării uh, această mențiune a dumneavoastră. Yeah, I think that um, I would like to return to this uh, topic of the um, this topic of doing uh, you know work with uh, with uh, music that is long in the past, and then and now maybe to turn to Zev to talk about the topic that he added to our conversation about uh, an observation about that the Ukrainians and the Jews, um, that, that the, the Ukrainians did not seem to work their Jewish dance tunes into a Ukrainian musical culture in the same way that the Bukovinian Moldavian musicians had a relation to Moldavian dance culture. In other words, uh, remnants of a purely a more specific Jewish intonatia uh, was more present and more prevalent in the earlier recordings from Podolia than in either Vasile's recordings from Bukovina or from Speranza's recordings in Moldova. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Zev to talk, uh, complicate this uh, idea a little bit more for us. Okay. And then we'll yeah. ask Vasile and Speranza, since we don't have Christian to ask about, uh, to sort of comment on their observations about this topic. Okay, to floor mine for a moment? Yeah. Can you hear me? Am yep. I clear? Yeah, okay, good. Now, in my article, my ancient article from 1994 on the Bulgar, I coined this terminology of a transitional repertoire, which uh, Speranza very kindly had used in her, her work in Botoshan. It's interesting that in all these years, I haven't had any discussion in ethnomusicology about the concept. I think either people assume it's so obvious that there's nothing to talk about. I, I don't know. But it's an important phenomenon that you have uh, one culture adapting a dance or a musical phenomenon from a neighboring culture, and of course, changing it according to its own taste. In my article in the Revista, I give a quick example of the Turks and the Greeks along the Aegean who have some of the same dances. And they play it in their own intonazi, of course. There's a Zeybek in Turkey and Zeybekiko among the Greeks. So you have this phenomenon. Now, point two, it's a very important phenomenon. It hasn't been studied nearly enough as it should be. 
in many countries. So point two, the actual demographics. Uh, I just I go just briefly to what uh, Speranza was saying. Uh, the Jewish connection with the, both the Fanariots and the Turks in Northern Moldova, there's recent research about this from Poland, from Dariusz Kolodziejczyk, which I think is very apt, uh, that after the war of 1711, the Russian invasion of 1711 in Moldova that failed, the Turks fortified Khotin. They gave the Pasha of Khotin thousands of more Yanichari troops, and they began to import Jews both from Istanbul and from Poland. And by the way, this is where my family comes in, how we got into the Khotin region. So there was a natural connection of the Jews, the Turks, the Greeks that influenced everything for many generations to come and went as far as Botoshan, actually. This is a, another discussion. I, I had a neighbor in, in New York from Botoshan, an old Jewish man, sometimes to amuse me, he would speak Romanian to me with a Turkish vocabulary. Interesting, it's in the 1990s. He would still speak this way, Mr. Roslan. Now, so this is a big subject. Third subject is about the difference between Ukraine and Moldova in this case. Obviously the Jews were in, in Ukraine for a very, 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 very long time, much longer than in Moldova. And by the way, the Turks had ruled there for a short period in Podolia and Professor Kolodziejczyk has very good studies on the Ottoman period in Podolia. Uh, but what's relevant here is that Again, I, would beca I became aware of this Ukrainian adaptation of Jewish freilas and husads and whatnot already in the late 1980s. And uh, I heard Izali Zemsovsky had some recordings of this material, which I think went back to the late uh, Raisa Gusak at the uh, conservatory in Vinitsa, who had done recordings of this. And over the years, I've heard different phases of the uh, Ukrainian brass bands playing the Jewish repertoire. And as, as Christina said, it's far closer to uh, a Jewish intonatia. Whereas, as we know, the Moldavian Bukovinian adaptation has changed the music very much. My only explanation is really very simple, that uh, this connection between the Lautar and the Jews goes back to the 18th century in Moldova. Whereas this, not that there weren't Jews in Klezmorum in, in Potoli, of course there were, but I don't think that this particular adaptation of the Jewish repertoire goes back before the Soviet period. I see no evidence for it. Neither Professor Gusak or, or Izali Zemsovsky or anybody else who's worked there has suggested that this phenomenon is pre-Soviet. It could be, <laughs> it could be, but uh, no one seems to have done the proper research and interviews as you did, so that we could know exactly how old this phenomena is. But if indeed it's something which began with the Soviet period, it's quite understandable that this would be regarded as a separate repertoire. It wouldn't yet be integrated completely into the Ukrainian dance repertoire. That's my only suggestion. Vasile or um, Speranza, do you have any thoughts about this? And Vasily, did you did you follow everything? Um, uh, I'm translating in chat for uh -huh, Vasily. Okay. So, okay. Um, da. I, am înțeles. Uh, sunt foarte interesante idee ale domnului Zev. Eu l-am citit. Am citit uh, lucrarea uh, capitolul care mi l-a trimis. L-am și tradus în română. Nu am reușit până la capăt să să să-l să pătrund, dar ideile de bază le-am reținut și în special concluziile. Uh, so, um, uh, Vasile read and even translated into Romanian the article uh, Zev uh, wrote, uh, uh, but uh, he needs uh, more to get into the depth of that, uh, those ideas and the argument. Uh, sunt de acord cu ideea că, că repertorul este un repertoriu de tranziție. Este, este, este conceptul cheie care, des, care deschide calea înțelegerii acestui repertor și acest, acest, acestui factor de, de legătură între culturi. Uh, uh, he says that the key um, uh, term here is uh, repertoire of transition, transition repertoire, because that's how you can uh, get to understand 
um, the complexity of that uh, repertoire. O să folosesc și eu acest concept și o să încerc și eu să-l dezvolt în baza uh, clasificărilor mele. Uh, he will uh, use the concept um, and apply it to his own research uh, to uh, look through this lens uh, back to his research. Great. So toate, I have... Toate uh, se mai poate, se poate. Uh, go on. Da, spuneți. Uh, toate mențiunile despre Husid, Hosid sau Hosid, Hosid, cum spuneți dumneavoastră, sunt foarte, foarte relevante pentru repertorul pe care îl studiez eu aici. Așa că eu o să le folosesc neapărat aceste, aceste, aceste sugestii. Sunt niște sugestii de ordin teoretic și epistemologic care deschide o portiță foarte interesantă în, în cercetare. So, um, uh, Zev, uh, your mentions and uh, interpretations, comments uh, on who sit and uh, the rest of the derivatives uh, are extremely relevant for his uh, repertoire, both from a theoretical and epistemological point of view. In special, idea that dance no appartenia dor culturi religiose a evreilor, ci și culturi laice. Era un dans de mostly the idea that the dance uh, did not belong only to the religious um, part of the culture but also beyond uh, religion. Iată pe această cale cred că a pătruns și în repertoriul de nuntă și de joc al românilor moldoveni. And that's how uh, it entered into the repertoire of weddings, Romanian weddings mm -hmm. and other celebrations uh, where dance was performed. For sure. Can I make a Uh, thank you, thank you. I make one other point that remember in the uh, Jewish klezmer repertoire, we have only one transitional repertoire, only one. Oh, and yeah. every, every single term in that repertoire is of Romanian origin. Everyone. We have Bulgarish, Bulgar, Sirba, Honga, which is Hangu, Jok, Hora. That's no, it. We don't have anything from Polish, from Ukrainian, from Lithuanian, no. Speranza? We have it from Romanian. Mm -hmm. I said doina, in the transition. Doina, sure, sure. In the non-dance, yes, in the non-dance, sure. Right. Uh, no, 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 hold up, Basile, hold up. That's, another... <laughs> that's a whole nother story. O sursa am vrut să vă adresez, o sursă. A lui Zinovi Stoiler, Idi și Doine, o aveți, da? Este foarte interesant. So that's, but that's a whole, that's a whole other, I should just make a footnote that the Romanian, Valachian, Moldavian influence in Jewish music goes deep into Hasidic music as well. We have, we have also the Volach, the Valach, in Chabad, all the way in Belarus, Lithuania. It's a profound uh, interaction. Secondly, confusion on the names of foreign dances in transitional repertoires. I found the same thing in actually in my article on Revista, I briefly mentioned the Turkish confusion of Sirto and Sirba. Right? And I learned this from the last Greek band leader in Istanbul, Stelio Barberis, that in the Greeks in Istanbul would call the chasapiko, the chasap dance, the sirba, the sirba. And then in the later generations, the Turks began making Turkish versions of Romanian versions of Greek dances that they called sirto, which is a very old name for a Greek dance. But sirto has nothing to do with sirba. Right, right. right? <laughs> There are layers and layers of confusion about names and spellings and origins and all of these things sort of littered across. <laughs> it's like it's like somebody took uh, a bunch of letters and put them in groups. Just threw them around. Threw them all over the map and people picked them up where they found them and then mm -hmm. combined them and spelled them in different languages. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what I find interesting uh, to, to sort of amplify what Zev was saying, Zev's essential point that in Moldova and with Romanian musicians, Romanian Moldova musicians, and, and to a certain extent in Besarabia proper, uh, uh, 
this mixing and adaptation is well established and long established. But even so, uh, when um, Esperanza and Florin were working in Botoshan specifically on this question, even so, your musicians and your informants could identify components and elements that were coming from. Sure. Uh, even though now we have many centuries of uh, mm -hmm. two centuries of, of musical interaction. Um, in that yes, way. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Speranza. I don't know, Florin Speranza, you have anything to, I want to say something. Uh, add to this? Yes, please. Uh, uh, discussed before a little bit about uh, incorporation of uh, Jewish uh, music in Moldavian music. And I want to discuss about the band, the instruments. I think in the 19th century, uh, the gypsy band from Moldavia was influenced by the Jewish band. And I think uh, it happened at least in three, three things. Firstly, the introduction of the cymbal. Uh, it's very possible to be uh, influenced by the uh, Jewish musician that played at that time. Se secondly, uh, probably the cello was also, maybe this is, was not the main influence, the only one influence, you know, maybe the cello was also using music. Mm -hmm. like, but the fact that exists also in the uh, Jewish band could influence the gypsy, uh, gypsy, gypsy band uh, at that time. And thirdly, uh, the fact that Moldavian Gypsy Band gave up fine flute mm -hmm. and uh, started to use uh, wind instruments like uh, flute, classical flute, uh, piccolo, clarinet, rigor. Mm -hmm. So this thing didn't happen in Valachia. The Valachian continued to use pan flute more than that. And Burada says, Say something about this the fact that Moldavian's bands gave up effort, but the Valachia still continue to use it. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, this instrument, wind instruments, were put in the band uh, in the Moldavian uh, old bands. Mm -hmm. um, I think this could be also a kind of integration of uh, influence from Jewish bands in the Gypsy uh, bands who play for Romanians, of course. Mm -hmm. What is I agree. <laughs> I agree. The absence, I didn't know that the, the muscal, the panpipe dropped out in Moldova. It makes perfect sense. And remember, we have documents about the Jewish klezmer ensemble going back to the early 17th century. The early 17th century. We have the guild records from Lvov from 1629. The lead instruments in 1629, violin, cymbalum. Everywhere we see klezmorum, there must be violin and cymbalum. Oh, the in other any country. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Speranza. Yeah. The other uh, violin, cymbalum are typical for southern um, uh, Montaigne. Oh. And remain, uh, yes, it remained like that because in um, Moldavia, the cymbalum was. Uh, no because, more in uh, fashion. Because mm. of the boom of the brass bands in the 20th yeah. century. Yeah. Uh, the same with the klezmer bands. We lost the symbol because yeah. of the brass bands. So uh, also our friend Paul Gifford, I, I learned a lot about his research about the history of symbolum. And he, 20 years ago, he convinced me that this was indeed a klezmer phenomenon of uh, joining the violin and cymbalum, and also the importation of the cymbal, cymbalum into the Romanian territories. Before that, in uh, Valachia, you had the santur. Mm -hmm. You had the Turkish santur. Um, he also has, a, in his book on the cymbalum and dulcimer, he has a wonderful chart of tunings. And of course, he, he learned that the tuning that, I, I'm a cymbalist, and the tuning that I use we have the first document of that in Jewish music from Belarus, all the way in the north and near, near Petersburg. It's the same tuning as the Greeks use and that you, you Wallachians use, the same tuning. So it indicates to me that this was the Jewish tuning that went all the way south and uh, it, it, it replaced whatever tuning had been used before. The older Turkish tuning was not that. 
for the Suntour. But you have one tuning from from Petersburg, you know, from Vitebsk all the way down to uh, to actually to Athens. Are you proposing, Zev? Mm -hmm. I, I see you, Florian, and I want to hear from you, but I, yeah. I just want to make sure that I understand. Are you proposing, perhaps, that a very early Turkish Santur tuning, uh, Turkish tuning, came north? Uh, no, no, au contraire. And, and, that and then the came Turks, back the, as a Jewish, an original no, Turkish tuning? No, the, the Jewish tuning replaced, it seems, we can't know for sure, but it seems that the Jewish tuning replaced the Turkish Santur tuning. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that at some point it. there was an early Turkish tuning uh, because of the instrument originally came to the Jews, to Jewish klezmorum. No, they no. They invented it themselves. The Santur, the Santur is, is related, but not the same. Aha. There's a Turkish tuning of what instrument? Of the Santur. And? The Santur is a cousin to the symbol. It's not identical. Right. So and, and dig this. When when the Jewish Klezmorim came with the Valachian Moldavian musicians to Istanbul, there was one Santur player at the court in the 1830s, Hilmi Bey, saw the cymbal and said, We should play something like that. And so he changed the tuning of the Turkish Santur into something like what the cymbal was. The Turkish musicologists know this, and my friends who do uh, ancient instruments in Istanbul, they distinguish between the form and the tuning of the Turkish uh, santur, and then the newer type of santur that was using the symbol of tuning. Okay, okay, great. I okay? want to <laughs> turn back to Florine. Yeah. I know you had a comment. I apologize for making you hold it for so long. I just wanted uh, to know if you felt that, uh, of course, I knew that, uh, I know that Santu was used in uh, Moldavia in Balakia in, uh, in the beginning of 19th century and before of this. But mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, of course, and probably Zep is uh, agree with me, I, I didn't see a continuation from Santu to Simbalo. The Santu was played in the court uh, Ottoman music. And uh, he disappeared with all the uh, Ottoman court music. But uh, Simbalum came uh, from other direction and integrated the gypsy band. Uh, and I think this Jewish is the other direction that came. I, I, did I say, make myself clear? Not yeah, so sure, yeah. sure. Well, you know that wonderful picture that uh, Nikolai Gogitsa used for the conference last year? Right, which is from the uh, Greek publication from uh, Bucharest in the 1790s, I believe. Yes, it shows a band with a Turkish tambour player, an Austrian violinist, a Moldavian night player, and there's a Greek, an Ottoman Greek playing some kind of santur in the picture. But too bad we can't know the tuning. Right. Right. What was the Great. I'd like to, um, we're going to start running out of our time here, and I'd like to just open the chat uh, and the floor to some questions from our um, audience. Uh, we have lots of friends here today, and I wonder if anybody has a particular idea or something that they'd like to hear more about or a question they'd like to ask from our discussants while we have them here in person. Clara, do you see anybody? Okay, so I'll ask again, does anybody have uh, anything that they'd like to ask from our experts while we have them here? Uh, I have questions, but I want to open the floor to other people who might have them. I have a practical question. My internet went down a couple of times. That doesn't usually happen, so I didn't catch everything. Will we have access to the recording later? Yes, yes, we are going to... Um, that gives me an opportunity to mention that um, these sessions, uh, Sunday has become an important day for everybody who uses Zoom and everybody who likes to have connections with people all around the world. And so um, because Sunday is such a busy day for scheduling, um, we have made a decision to record all of our sessions and we will make them available uh, probably later in January for people to review. Um, we have to add some, do a little bit of light editing um, to, to make them available. And so we will do that. So you will have access to these conversations again. Uh, and also I will mention that these sessions are entirely funded by the donations of the people who come uh, to visit them. So if you haven't had a chance to make a donation uh, to our link, please 
uh, if you can, of course, I mean, it's a tough times for everybody. Um, but if you can, if you have a little extra, um, a uh, couple of dollars to throw into our tip jar to help pay for our translators and for our discussants, that would be very much appreciated. And it will help us as Klezmer Institute reach our fundraising goal for the year, um, which I'm sure you'll hear more about uh, uh, more about on different times. I hear a comment from Miriam Isaacs who uh, notes that her mother is from Marmuresh, you know, so that's great. Uh, Zev, do you have anything else that you'd like to add here for about our topics? Well, I guess what I said initially as a topic was the difference between present-oriented research and recent research. And of course, we all know we, the difference between that, but I just want to stress that it seems to me that Vasile was essentially working with the, the present situation whereas Speranza and, and uh, Florin were working with the present as a view to the recent past. And uh, of course, in, in my uh, interviews with musicians, few that they were, I was talking about a, a not so recent past or learning about a not so recent past because these people are already had emigrated some, some years before. Um, Hank Kisnetsky's work, for example, I should mention, uh, with uh, a, a German Goldenstein, who was a klezmer, kind of klezmer from northern Moldova, who had left just before Vasile uh, had done his his field work in the area. So there's these overlaps, and uh, uh, and going back even to the let's say to the research of Moshe Beregovsky in Kiev, it's important to remember that he had to balance what he was actually seeing with what people told him about the past, because in that Soviet period, he had to, uh, let's say, he had to give the impression that all these customs were dead and that he was only talking about the past. So he gives in a sense a false impression of past in order to not to bother the censors in that, you know, in that Stalinist period. Whereas the very first article about klezmer music, which is in Russian, the Evgeny Orchestre by Ivan Lipayev, published in 1904 in the Tsarist period, he's a non-Jewish musician who's talking about the Jewish wedding as something happening in the present. And he's able to describe things happening in the present because that's not a problem. So uh, I, that's something that we have to bear in mind when we read anybody's research on such uh, let's say, uh, delicate uh, subjects. Are they talking about the real present? Are they talking about the present as a window to the a recent past? You know, is everything really over? Or, or is it not, simply not, not open? I mean, the impression I got, for example, from also from Hankus's work and other people, that, uh, that there were many Jewish events going on in Bessarabia, Moldova, in the Soviet period, that were kept rather quiet. That simply weren't public. And also my wife's work, Judith Frigishi, her work with Jewish religious singing in Hungary in, this, in the communist period, uh, she's talking about a present which was a concealed present. That the kind of uh, ritual prayers that were done in very small communities, and in fact, uh, there were, the, the people there were very worried about outsiders being spies for the government. So that's another thing to keep in mind when we're you know, looking at this research with, in this case, Jewish topics. In other countries, it could be other, other groups that are, you know, like when I read in Turkish about Kurdish things, I see that there's also a, a present, a past, a recent past, a concealed present, and so forth. Uh, and this is a phenomenon, I'm sure, in many, in many countries where there's a hegemonic dominant group and a not so dominant group. Um, and, and we have to, to bear in mind, those of you who actually did the work understand uh, much better about what was, what could be the present at a particular time and what had to be represented as a past. Yes, uh, Evgenia Kazdan uh, writes uh, very succinctly in the chat that the past is not dead, it was forbidden. Uh, okay. And I think that really that sort of sums up uh, very precisely what Zev is talking about, the difference between 
uh, Lipayev in 1905, writing about a, a, a living Jewish presence, uh, whereas Berogovsky, short time later, is forced by the state system to speak about, uh, to, to kill his own culture in some ways, in this sort of metaphorical sense, in order to be able to describe it. Oh, by the he way. Has to, he has to act as if it is long in the past, or it is no longer functioning. A good example is how Berogovsky describes the Chosid dance. It's a, it's a classic example of disinformation given by the greatest authority in Jewish music and dance. But if he has a footnote about Chosid, where it's, uh, it's again, it's something completely of the past and it's only a parody. Right. So we have a, uh, Claire, thank you for writing this, uh, this question that um, I am almost hesitant to write because it will require us another good hour to answer. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. And, um, and I'm gonna read it out loud to everybody here. And it says, what is the importance uh, and role of classification systems and categories used by Vasile Speranza Zev in their research and field work? And I'm gonna take a moment of privilege wow. and answer this, <laughs> Make, take one little slice. I'm gonna put my hand on one part of the elephant uh, to describe um, something that came up in our conversation with Vasile the other day, which is, and, and also very directly speaks to this topic today of, um, which is that uh, Vasile's work, in my understanding today, is to create, to take the misinformation that he's described about this Hussar, this colonized, uh, Sovietized uh, word, this made up description of a thing that, in, that we believe didn't exist, uh, that was used to blanket uh, this term, to colonize this term with a Russian influence. And his work has been to uh, make a distinction and uh, a distinguish this mm. genre and show its connections to a Jewish musical interaction. Um, I'm going to let Vasile speak to this, but I think that this, uh, what, what I would say about this is that the role of classification and uh, thoughtful classification is essential for us to understand these ideas. Because if you don't, something without a definition cannot exist, right? That's something I learned from Zev, actually. Um, something without a definition can't exist. And so, so Vasile's work in a large part, in this, this portion of Vasile's work uh, and an ongoing part of his work has been to define this idea, Freilich, uh, and pull it out from the general category of Jok or Hora. He is, he has, uh, and Sheerul as not just, um, not just this undistinguished Hora. And so um, that work to give a history and a place for this Hussar, Husik Husin, uh, that he's able to identify is extremely important, uh, as is Zev's work to identify the core repertoire, transitional rep repertoire, and so on. So um, I'd like to now anybody, Zev or Esperanza, uh, Vasile Florian, if you'd like to speak to this as well. Well, let me jump in and say, okay. Esperanza, I hope to hear from you too, and Vasile, that, that uh, sometimes a name, an emic internal name can be important but other times there are other features, compositional features, features of intonatia and performance articulation that within the culture are part of the definition. And of course, since I'm also a dancer in, in the things which are danced, they have to be danceable within that culture. And most, many Jewish dances in the way that Jews dance them would not be danceable outside of the Jewish Yiddish culture. They wouldn't be interesting. Whereas, for example, share, it's a very old transnational form coming from 18th century Germany as the share dance or the counter dance, also the English dance that was adopted by the Jews in the 18th century. 
and spread with that name, the German name Sher, everywhere where Jews lived and spoke Yiddish. There was no alternative name for Sher in Yiddish. It must be Sher. And the dance form is the same in Lithuania, in Moldova, in Ukraine, in Poland, it's the same. Same name, same dance form. Sometimes things are not so, so neat and so simple. And again, the transitional repertoire in Jewish culture, we had no problem with using the Romanian names for those dance and listening forms, doina. And they, they had to have Romanian names. No matter how far away from Moldova, if you were in Poland, if you were in Lithuania, you would have those Romanian origin names. That's very, very striking that you would have that. Uh, perhaps with some confusion, but there would be those names for the foreign thing. There were many other foreign things that the Jews may have played uh, for, for non-Jews. But this is something that was part of the, it was internal. I make, okay, for me, it was important to make a distinction between the core and the transitional, because in the case of the transitional, the foreign name was still remembered. And again, my, my contention is that the uh, Moldavian dance forms that came into Jewish music were probably as such not before the middle of the 19th century, not before. There were other Ottoman Greek features that were coming into Yiddish music much, much earlier. And we have evidence of that, both the manuscripts and in terms, but these were not using Romanian names, no. Again, because my, my, my contention is that probably the uh, city people living in Yash or in Botoshan, uh, many of whom were speaking Greek as well as Romanian, they, they weren't interested in publicizing the folkloric dances so much until a certain point historically. So what we see in the Jewish sources before are more Greek and Turkish elements that no doubt were known in the cities. So I, I'm just suggesting that this terminology is something which uh, it, can, it can change, it can evolve historically, but often once it's in the culture, it stays there in that form. In the same way that we use share, uh, it came in no later than the early, probably the late 18th century, because I know from the German research that by the early 19th century, the Germans dropped the term share. They used other words for that dance. Only the Jews were continuing to call it Sher, and then the Moldavians who learned Shire from the Jews, not from the Germans, from the Jews. So sometimes this history of confusion of terminology, we can learn a lot uh, from this. Okay. That's, yes, that's please. great. That's fantastic. But Anstan Florine, do you have anything that you'd like to add to this? It was pleasant to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, uh, the, the topic before about the present uh, past uh, issue. I was thinking that when we work with this local series of cities, can you pull your microphone up, please? Uh, there we go. Sorry. Can you hear me better? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, about this uh, topic of past and present, actually, when we work in this endocrine series, uh, the thing is that we go into the region and we make a research about what is happening now. For instance, what is happening in the wedding now, what uh, music is mm -hmm. what, and so on. But when we record, we focus on the point, the one that in a way is not so present today in the wedding parties, is not so present today in the actual practice. Like 50 years ago, because we find that the music is interesting, valuable, and uh, do you understand me? Yeah, you're a little bit, you're a little bit garbled. If I go today to a, I don't know, a wedding where mm. a first band is playing, I can hear all kinds of music. Uh, I'm losing him. <laughs> we lost you. Try again. Try to say that last bit. You said we got, you go to a wedding, you can hear all kinds of music, and then after that, you cut out. Very, very, very little uh, music from the old stratum, from the mm. uh, sure. from the 60s. 
but we are interested in that music that is very local and that is uh, the tradition of that uh, area. And actually, when we make recordings with the musicians, we discuss and uh, we record that old music. And we also discuss about how the things work. So all the time, I think now it becomes a kind of pattern of our uh, CDs is uh, the situation from now and the, the music from yesterday. Absolutely. Speranza? Hmm. In an anthology, not a um, image of nowadays. And anyway, you know, in a way, he is right. But on the other hand, there are situations that in which the music we are recording still exists in family uh, circles, in different circumstances. It's not something invented by us. We did mm -hmm. oh, But exactly. uh, they, we took only a part of musical reality to put it on the, our records because we want to make an anthology for any time. It's happening that the local music, local music. Say that last part again, the hmm. local music, sorry. It's more and more marginal. Um, um, to teach more attention. Um, um, uh, has a comment too. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's pull, hold up, pull that thought, Florin. Vasile had something he'd like to add here. Domnul Vasile, spune Mulțumesc. Eu aș vrea, în primul rând, să mulțumesc tuturor pentru această minunată ocazie. Pentru mine este foarte instructiv aceast, aceast, această comunicare cu dumneavoastră. To communicate with you, to have this conversation with you is extremely informative for um, him. De ce e instructiv? Fiindcă îmi confirmă anumite uh, idei și concepții care mi le-am creat deja pentru mine, referitor la dialogul cultural în repertorul muzicii de dans din Moldova și Bucovina. Um, and it is, uh, it confirms his ideas and conceptions about the intercultural dialogue in the music uh, in Moldova. Din anii 2000, din anii 2000, am început să pun problema dialogului intercultural. Și yeah. am ajuns la ideea că un factor important în acest dialog, un agent important cultural, au fost anume evrei. And uh, starting with 2000, he focused more and more on the intercultural dialogue and he discovered that one of the most important agents of uh, this dialogue was the Jewish element. Până în anul 2000, aveam concepția tradiționalistă asupra folclorului, asupra genurilor, asupra structurii culturii tradiționale, muzicale. So up to 2000, uh, he used to have the traditional perspective on genres, uh, forms, uh, folklore, traditions. O importanță deosebită a avut lucrările pe care le-am citit pe internet ale cercetătorilor americani în special la această problemă a dialogului intercultural. Inter, inter și în special articolul, cum am spus, despre bulgarească, bulgariș, a domnului Zev. Acolo am găsit ceea ce deja îmi aparea la mie ideea, că există un repertoriu de bază, genuri de bază și genuri de tranzitive și su suprapuse. Și am făcut o altă clasificare a, a structurii muzicii tradiționale de dans. Această uh, concepție... Uh, um, so it was extremely important for him because he read online uh, the articles of American researchers and uh, of specific importance was Zev's article because uh, he realized how important it is and confirmed also his research uh, distinguishing between the core repertoire and transition repertoire and he realized that he needs to do work more on classification because there are juxtaposes and also overlaps. Iată de acolo, de la acel articol, am mi-am schimbat 
viziune asupra, asupra muzicii, a structurii muzicii tradiționale de dans. Și am înțeles unde revine locul muzicii evreiești în această structură generală. And he realized uh, that uh, the Jewish music has a specific place um, in uh, the realm of the dance music uh, in, in the region, the structure of the dance music in the region. Am identificat cinci genuri de bază, core, core repertoire. So five genres, five genres in the core repertoire. Apoi, apoi un stratum de legătură, medium, and then, de trecere uh, de, la, de la fundamental la, la superior. And then a, a transition layer between uh, the core repertoire to the surface structure. Iar mai sus, începând cu secolul XIX-lea, apare stratul superior unde sunt implicați și evrei. And in the important. century, um, um, uh, he discovered a new layer, uh, an upper layer, where the Jewish um, presence is obvious. Trei straturi care comunică între ele permanent. De la fundament spre vârf și de la vârf spre fundament. And these are the three major layers that uh, always have communicated, uh, influencing each other. From nu, up, uh, nu voi descrie acum întreg, întreg sistemul, că e, e, e lungă problema, dar mm. iată, a, ideea că împărțirea pe straturi, pe repertoriu de bază și repertoriu asociat sau de tranziție, am preluat anume din școala, școala uh, americană și în special prin dumneavoastră, Dumnezeu. Acest lucru pe mine m-a ajutat foarte mult. Să înțeleg, uh, să înțeleg esența. Evolutie. The idea um, of this structure um, um, between uh, core and um, transition repertoires helped him a lot to understand how these layers communicate uh, upside down, no, uh, from uh, bottom up and, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, și, și de, de acolo am deschis discuția mai larg asupra influențelor în muzica tradițională. Și un loc distins a avut-o influențele evreiești. Eu am pus această problematică în discuție, aici, mai pe larg. And um, that's how uh, he um, realized the, uh, the major influence of the Jewish music in the, the traditional music that uh, he had studied um, even before that. Ultima remarcă. Ok, Vasile. Go on. Ultima remarcă. The last point he wants yeah. to make. Please. Da. Please. În 2004, prin voia sorții, am fost chemat să particip la o conferință pe ca la care eu nu doream. <coughs> uh, organizată de Partidul Comuniștilor Moldova, casa noastră comună. Mm -hmm. Și mi s-a propus... Da, spuneți. Uh, so, in 2004, he was invited to participate in a conference organized by the... Uh, casa noastră. He didn't... Comună. Uh, casa. So, the... Uh, the shared house, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, shared home. Shared home. Eu nu știam ce temă să iau. Dar aveam materialul despre muzica evrească. Zic, aici o să fac materialul acesta. Și acolo l-am prezentat pentru prima dată. And he didn't know what uh, he was supposed to talk about, but he already had prepared um, something on Jewish music, and that was precisely what he presented there. În scopul de a arăta că nu numai cultura superioară venită din Est este importantă, ci și influențele care au venit și din centru și din vest prin evrei. Uh, and he wanted, uh, the, his goal was to show that it is um, uh, equally important that the, uh, not only that the culture from the east had a uh, uh, print on uh, Moldovan culture, but also what he came from the central and western Europe through the Jewish influence. Fantastic. Această temă am dezvoltat-o și cu personalitatea lui Milu Lemes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, and yeah. that was uh, the same idea that he 
uh, worked on when he wrote about Milo Lemesh. That right. Can I just say one, no, one remark? On okay. Yes, uh, I, I want to get to Zev in one second. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I'm just going to, before we conclude with Zev's comment, um, I wanted, I need to put something in Florin's mind, uh, which is to say that there was a question from Pete Ruszewski to uh, our, our group, and that has to do with, um, and this is probably for all three of you or all of you, but um, particularly for Florian, because I know that you sort of live here. Um, are there examples of continuity in Ottoman instrumental facile genres such as Peshrev and Saz Shamai that you have encountered in your work in Romania? I know that Zev has thoughts about this and, and comments to say, but um, if we can't surface it now, I'd be interested to hear uh, from you um, if you have thoughts about that. And then I also wanted to make sure that everybody um, was able to catch the end of another comment that Florian made, which was, uh, that got garbled in the microphone, mm. which was to say that um, in his and Speranza's work with Ethnophonia uh, record label and their collecting of mus local music all around Romania, um, they would start by going to a wedding and looking for the older music and he says that um, the local musics have become more and more marginalized mm -hmm. in the context of, of current events um, such as weddings and so that their 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 work was to discover and investigate that older music which was becoming more and more out of fashion so um, yeah. yeah Florian did you have something else you wanted to add to that and then we'll go back to Zev it is uh the first uh, question about the uh, Ottoman genres in the Yeah, we're having a abandoned somewhere in the before the middle of the nineteenth century. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Um that's a subject also for another another time, Definitely. another conversation, <laughs> a long conversation. But Zev, uh, I, I want to return to your point, and then unfortunately we're going to have to wrap up our session. Yeah. So I'll keep it very brief. Yeah. And I'm very gratified, first of all, that to learn that uh, Vasile uh, got so, so much, and also Speranza got so much out of this article that I published in 1994. Now, part of why I was publishing this article then, I was then writing my book on Ottoman music. Okay, so this was just a sideshow for me. That my music on the Ottoman court was almost finished. But my teacher, Dave Taras, Dovid Taraschuk, who was a great, great klezmer clarinetist and composer who had studied in Yedinitz before he came in northern Moldova, before he came to New York. He passed away a few years ago. And I wanted to write something about his music. He was the master of creating what I call the hybrid, the Freilax, uh, you know, Freilax uh, Bulgar hybrid, which is to say the core plasma repertoire and the transitional repertoire and mixing them together in a way that the immigrant Jewish audience could really appreciate it. Not only that, the immigrant Greek audience really appreciated it. His producer for this recording was a man named Tetos Dimitriadis, who was a Greek from Istanbul, a very well-known producer, an entrepreneur. He would take some of Taras's compositions for the Jews, rename them in Greek, sell them in Greek to Greek to a Greek audience. <laughs> How about that? So the Fenariots were not dead, even in New Jersey, <laughs> right in the 1950s. So it's amazing. This is not this is not ethnomusicology. This, or you might say, it's living ethnomusicology by the people. That's what I have to say for now. <laughs> Right. And and in some ways, there's, you know, I mean, this is this is the story of Romanian folk music, as I understand it. And as Florian and Speranza mm. have uh, so much uh, shared with us, you know, that this living uh, uh, connections and mixes between uh, genres and tunes uh, is precisely what they found in Botoshan and, and what they surfaced sure. as these internal these musicians were able to identify uh, a, a Jewish repertoire, but also 
uh, mm -hmm. position it within their their own traditional music repertoire. So, um, unfortunately, I think we have to wrap up yeah, our session. Yeah. Um, thank you all for being here with us today uh, for nearly two hours. Um, an edited version of this will appear online uh, at a later date. And we are hoping to also figure out a way that we can continue these conversations um, in different ways in the future. Um, so if you have suggestions of ideas of, of things that you would like to hear about and people you might like to hear from, please do let us know. We have a series of uh, conversations with archivists that we are planning for 2021. And we'd also like to invite uh, some of our gramophone people. Uh, those are uh, people like Michael Aylward who have been working with uh, gramophone recordings now for many, many years, Jeff Wallach, um, about what we can learn about Jewish music when we speak to uh, people who have been doing discographies and listening to scratchy old records and what we can learn from people who work directly with the collections uh, that were made in earlier periods. For example, Eleanor Bizinski and her work on the Ruth Rubin archive. And we think it would be really interesting to hear from her about her work taking a very deep dive into that uh, collection. So with that, I'd like to thank you once again, uh, all of you who have joined us today. I'd like to thank our discussants, uh, Vasile Kiselitsa, Speranza Radulescu, Florin Jordan, and Z Walter Zev Feldman, uh, with a special shout out to Ileana Marin for joining us. Uh, Clara has been running tech for us for all of our sessions, so a big shout out to Clara. And, um, and Yiddish New York, uh, who has helped us co produce this event and also to the um, discretionary fund of Congregation Albert in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico for giving us a bit of funding to help make this project happen. So with that, I'd like to say good afternoon, good evening, buona sera, and uh, we will meet again soon. We can unmute and say goodbye, everybody, if you want to say hi and bye at the same time. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Hi and Hello. bye. Thank you. <laughs>